Hello and welcome to the Farming Week, the podcast from Agriland that keeps you up to date with all the latest in Irish agriculture. I'm Charles O'Donnell and I'm joined by Ashling O'Brien, Colm Ryan, Louise Hickey and Agriland Beef Specialist Brettany O'Brien. We have a good bit to get through this week with several talking points in the agri sector in recent days. We have seen a number of milk prices for July supplies announced at this point. At the time of recording, both Lakeland Dairies and Kerry Dairy Ireland have announced increases to their prices. Of course, we also had the Tullamore Show and FBD National Livestock Show on Sunday. If you want to check out all the winners across the various livestock classes, you can check out AgriLand's Parade of Champions article, which you can read on our website and app. There was some controversy at this year's show in relation to delays experienced by attendees due to higher than expected attendance numbers in the morning, along with traffic on the roads. The show organisers apologised for the delays and said they will review traffic management ahead of next year's show. But we're going to start this week with an announcement that was made by Minister Charlie McConlog at the Tullamore Show, a potentially important announcement for generational renewal on farms. Ashling, can you take us through the details on this? Yes, Charles. So as is often the case uh, with big dates on the agricultural calendar, Minister Charlie McConlogue used Tullamore Show to announce that he is setting up a commission on generational renewal in farming. So he said he was taking that move ahead of the European Commission publishing proposals for the next CAP, the next Common Agricultural Policy, which of course will kick in after 2027. And they're going to be publishing proposals in the middle of next year. So this would be part of Ireland's preparations ahead of that. Now, the minister said the commission is going to look at whether the arrangements which are currently in place and currently on offer, aiming to support young people to come into the farming sector and to encourage generational renewal are effective. And he listed the supports which are currently on offer for the likes of farm partnerships, the complementary income support for young farmers, higher rates of grants for capital investment on farms and increased access to finance and significant and agri-taxation reliefs. And we recently reported here on AgriLand how the Department of Agriculture spent around half a million euro on various farm partnership supports last year. But the minister acknowledged that we do need to look honestly now at whether these types of measures, Charles, are having the desired effect out there. And to see exactly how these supports may be rejigged or, you know, reworked to better encourage the likes of land transfer and succession planning. And we spoke about succession planning with solicitor Deirdre Flynn on our sister podcast, Law on the Land, recently. And it really is a complex issue, Charles. It can be influenced by many factors and it can be really on an individual farm by farm basis as well. It's not really a one size fits all when it comes to succession. But I think that this new commission shows that the government acknowledges that more has to be done to support both new entrants and those maybe perhaps who wish to retire or maybe want to step back from farming in their latter years. Now, IFAX Farm Report, which was published earlier this year, shows that succession planning is still a major stumbling block for farmers out there. 48% of farm families were yet to identify a successor, according to that survey, which was carried out last November. It's actually an improvement, though, when you looked at the previous year's figure of 69%. And farm viability was identified as the biggest obstacle to succession planning. And that was followed by a lack of interest from the next generation. And also that the farming lifestyle doesn't appeal to young people as well as it currently stands. So we really... All we know at this point when it comes to this commission um, is that the minister said he's going to be bringing together a group of people with relevant expertise and experiences to take an objective and robust evidence based look at all of the factors in play. And the minister said that young people and new entrants are central uh, to generational renewal and, you know, uh, preparations for a new cap, but also the longevity of our farming sector. We need young people to to come into this sector, Charles, and to to revitalise it and to keep it going for future generations. And Ashling, what's been the reaction from farm organisations to the minister's announcement? So I mentioned farm viability there being a major issue when it comes to succession, Charles. And that is something that the farm organisations highlighted when reacting to this announcement. The IFA president, Francie Gorman, said that farm incomes are key to attracting the next generation into the sector. And he said this commission cannot be just a talking shop. And he said that less than 7% of farmers out there are under the age of 35. That's a 
figure which has more or less halved in the past two decades. And the 2023 Chagask National Farm Survey highlighted that just 28% of all farms out there are classed as viable. And the situation when it comes to dry stock farms was more challenging, particularly on cattle rearing farms, where just 11% were deemed viable last year. And that figure was down 5% year on year. Now, Francie Gorman said that income challenges and increasing regulatory burdens are putting the next generation off. Now, the Irish Creamery Milk Suppliers Association said this commission was an exercise in futility. They weren't mincing their words. Dennis Drennan, the association's president, said that young people would judge a career in farming and primary food production on the same basis as any other career option. And there are more choices out there, Charles, at the moment. And young people are taking advantage of that. And maybe they don't feel the the obligation to go into farming, maybe that previous generations did, and that there is more options and the world has become a smaller place. And Dennis Drennan said that the government, in his view, had an inability or an unwillingness to accept collapsing farm incomes and the regulatory pressures, which are ever increasing as well. And he said it was very obvious to the ICMSA what the issues out there were on the ground and that they could save the government time and money on setting up this new commission. And he said the reason that the children of farm families don't want to follow their parents into farming is because those children see the hours and years of hard work and the stress and official indifference. And they calculate very quickly, he said, that there are easier and better paid careers in almost any other sector. And he said they were regularly encountering situations where parents were actually telling their children to think long and hard about following them into farming. So a really stark picture there. And they said that if the minister feels the need to establish a commission to tell him something as screamingly self-evident as that, then it only underlines that sense of disconnect and unreality uh, that is there. Now, MACRA, of course, they've been a very vocal farm organisation when it comes to the area of young farmers, succession and land mobility. And they said this commission was a very long time coming. And in their pre-budget submission this year, Mocker highlighted the need for a pilot succession scheme to encourage more young people to consider agriculture as a future career. And I suppose it'd be interesting to see when budget 2025 rolls around in a few weeks time, Charles, if uh, maybe the minister includes that in his wish list uh, for the minister for finance, uh, because if he is setting up this commission, it might be a way to to get ahead of it. Now, Mocker, of course, has been campaigning on succession for, for many, many years. And in 2015, it established established a land mobility service as well that actually works to match farmers who want to retire with young farmers who are seeking access to land as well. Now, Makara President Elaine Houlihan, she welcomed the announcement of this committee, but she said that the members of Makara are not willing to wait to see what CAP 2027 brings. They need more than a committee and they need action now. And she said they look forward to positively engaging with this committee, but they said that their members are immigrating at the moment because they don't have access to land and their patience essentially has run out. And the final reaction that we'll bring you on this is from the Irish Cattle and Sheep Farmers Association abroad welcome from them for this commission. They said that it was a recognition by the Minister of the challenges faced by young farmers out there. But the ICSA President Sean McNamara said that the current range of supports in their members' experience shows that these measures aren't really adequately addressing what are the fundamental issues out there preventing young people from coming into agriculture and staying in agriculture. He pointed to high land prices, limited access to credit, regulation again, and the uncertainty surrounding farm income as well. And he did call on the government to back up any recommendations that are made by this committee in the coming weeks and months ahead, Charles, that they have to be backed by funding and that this isn't just a report that is carried out and put up on a shelf and that we don't hear any more from. This is important. You know, if this is a recognition by the government that we need to do more to get young people into farming, then we need to fund it properly. We need to resource it properly and uh, make it more than just a talking shop as the farm organisations have warned. Yes, Ashling, a very good point there from ICSA President Sean McNamara. We're going to move on now to an important animal health and welfare issue. The Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine has said that regional veterinary laboratories around the country are seeing an increased prevalence of the disease blackleg. Colm, First of all, what is blackleg and what have regional veterinary laboratories noticed? Blackleg is a common disease of cattle worldwide which causes acute muscle damage and usually results in death or death after a short illness. 
The disease is caused by a bacteria. And yes, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine have said that the regional vet laboratories have noted a sharp increase in the prevalence of black leg diagnosis in cattle. So the department said that the factors causing these current large outbreaks are unclear. But in a recent report from the regional vet labs, it was stated there that outbreaks of black leg have been reported after earthworks were carried out on farms. Now, these earthworks included field drainage work, road construction, and exposure of earth floors during mucking out of buildings, all of which can cause exposure to the highly resistant clostridial spores in the soil. These clostridial spores can enter the body of an animal by ingestion through skin wounds or via contaminated needles and injection equipment. In the regional vet labs report, it recommended that in one particular case of blackleg, that a review of the farm's clostridial vaccine program with the herd owner was advisable. The Athlone Regional Vet Lab diagnosed several cases of poisoning in cattle caused by ragwort, with multiple deaths reported in affected herds. One such case uh, occurred when a two-year-old heifer was presented for a post-mortem in the lab, and the carcass was pale and the liver was pale and difficult to cut, is what the uh, Regional Vet Lab said. Those damaged liver findings were found to be caused by the ingestion of plants such as ragwort. Another case was identified in an 11-month-old Hereford wainling that was submitted to a lab in Limerick, uh, which was from a dairy to calf uh, to beef enterprise. And that was the fourth animal to die over a fourth-week period on the farm. The clinical signs reported were weakness, blindness, and frothing from the mouth. Poisoning due to ragwort consumption was uh, suspected to be the cause from the lab. A review and change of the silage diet was recommended by the lab as well and uh, it is certainly an issue that is happening in, in on a lot of farms in Ireland. Certainly in Northern Ireland the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute has seen an increase in submissions of carcasses in recent months that were exposed to ragwort. Uh, so with livestock now grazing it is important to be aware of the risks from that plant poisoning. Thanks for those updates, Colm. And just before we move away from the issue of animal health, and a brief word of advice for farmers to use padded envelopes when sending samples away for BVD testing. One lab in Oldcastle, County Meath, said that it was receiving damaged envelopes every day, often resulting in the samples themselves being damaged or even lost. So that's just something to keep in mind. Moving on now, and Brefney, it appears there are some changes afoot for those viewing livestock sales online at some marts. Can you take us through the details on this? Yeah, that's right, Charles. So farmers who view or bid on livestock in online sales at some marts are set to be hit with a new monthly payment fee from the 1st of September of this year. Uh, just today, LSL Auctions has confirmed uh, via a notice on its app that it is set to introduce a bid and view membership and a view only membership. Now, uh, there are two different payment uh, structures here. So the bid and view membership will be €10 Euro a month and the view only membership will cost farmers €5 Euro a month. So in a statement to Agriland, the LSL auction CEO, Brendan Hannigan, said uh, the membership to LSL allows access to all marts, auctions and sales on the LSL platform and users can pay on a monthly basis for either of the two membership options. Um, he also explained that a discounted annual membership of €50 Euro per year with two months free is available for view only, while the annual membership for bid and view is €100 Euro per year, uh, also with two months free. Any me membership fees which are paid now will only take effect from September 1st, 2024, according to the company. And Brefni, since the COVID-19 pandemic, this has become a kind of a popular way for farmers to engage with the livestock sale process. How are farmers likely to react to this news? Yes, yeah, so I suppose the news of the monthly subscription fee for farmers to view to both view and bid at Livestock Marts online will come as a surprise as farmers had enjoyed free access to the service since the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, of course, the outbreak of COVID-19 resulted in marts across the country having to close to farmers and also saw the introduction of online bidding to marts across the country. Uh, while since then ringside bidding has returned, but the use of online bidding has remained hugely popular at all types of livestock sales as some purchasers prefer, prefer buying their cattle or livestock through the online method. As well as this, many farmers with livestock to sell also opt to not attend the sale and instead view their cattle or sheep being sold online where they can see the price they have received. 
So it'll be interesting to see how these changes will be received uh, by farmers, Charles. Thanks for that update, Breffney. Well, the issue of fodder for the winter is one that is picking up pace as the year progresses, with farm organisations, dairy processors and other groups warning of a potential shortage. And now, Eshling, the group representing farm contractors has added its voice to those concerns. Yes, Charles. So as we've been reporting here on the podcast in recent weeks, Chagask is urging farmers to complete a fodder budget to make sure they have adequate stocks for the upcoming winter based on the amount of livestock they're expecting to carry over those months. And data presented to the National Fodder and Food Security Committee meeting in early July highlighted that up to 30% of farms had fodder deficits of more than 10% for the coming winter. So AgriLand decided this week to see what the current picture on the ground looks like as second cut silage is underway or maybe completed in some areas. And as you said, we approached the Association of Farm and Forestry Contractors in Ireland, the FCI, who carried out a survey of their members exclusively for AgriLand last weekend on what was the current state of fodder reserves on farms where they are operating on. Now, the FCI has a database of around 1,500 contractors, and each of them works on average on three Irish farms every day. So that gives them a unique insight into what is happening out there on the ground. Now, the survey respondents were from every county across the Republic, and all of them are agricultural contractors who provide silage harvesting services for their client farmers. And I suppose the overall finding from the survey was that 71% of the contractors who responded believe that there will be a shortage of fodder on many Irish farms this winter. And the findings show that the area of second cut silage has not increased despite the efforts of the Department of Agriculture and Chagask to encourage an increase in silage harvesting. 64% of the 67 contractors who responded to that question said that the area of second cut silage they had harvested this year has not increased. And the survey also indicated that second cut silage crops are actually lighter this year compared with last year. I'd say that won't come as a surprise to many farmers listening out there, given the weather conditions that we've had over the past few months, which have restricted growth in many areas around the country as well, Charles. And the contractors said that lower fertilizer use due to the confusion amongst farmers about their allowances was also uh, playing a role here as well, along with uh, poor soil temperatures and a lack of rainfall too. Now, 73% of 74 FCI members who responded to this question in the survey said that second cut silage crops were not as heavy as last year. And as I said, 71% of 76 contractors who responded said that they believe there will be a shortage of fodder on many farms based on what they're seeing out there as well. And uh, look, again, Charles, I think it all comes back to the fact that farmers are being urged again to to do that fodder budget, to sit down and to work it out. We have details on AgriLand of how to do that. And I know that many farmers out there are acutely and keenly aware of what they need for the the upcoming winter, but it's just to to put those plans in place now and uh, to make sure that if you are looking at like you're going to have a shortfall to, to put plans in place to either secure extra forage or maybe um, see what else could be done. Could a third cut maybe be done? And uh, we've a lot of advice from our technical team on AgriLand's website and app on that to to help you along as well. But uh, a tricky time out there at the moment, uh, according to FCI contractors, and it will be interesting to see. I know Chagask will do an updated fodder survey in the coming weeks, Charles, and that will be presented to the fodder committee as well. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what those survey findings will show as well. Yeah, for sure, Ashling. That's going to be a really important survey by Chagas when it comes out. We're going to move on now to a somewhat unusual but very serious matter, which is agricultural businesses being hacked, with the hackers then using those details to target farmers with scams. Louise, this is a complex matter. Can you break it down for us? Yes, Charles. So an agricultural business in County Westmeath, which sells machinery parts, has been targeted by scammers. Details of the name and address for the business are currently being used on a legitimate EU-wide machinery sales website, but by a fraudulent account. On the site where the owner has not posted any advertisements, there are tractors currently for sale under his business's name, with prices ranging from about £19,000 to £48,000. There's a UK email address linked to the account as a contact detail, and there's also an Irish phone number 
which do look legitimate. I did actually try to ring the phone numbers. However, they're just ringing out, but will respond via text or WhatsApp. So obviously the scammer wants to contact customers and engage with them through online and text formats. Now, the agri business owner didn't realize this was going on until they realized until they received a phone call from a customer inquiring to see a tractor for sale. This particular caller had purchased from the Westmead business before and thought the advertisement was suspicious as the business does not sell tractors. It seems the fraudsters stole the details of the bona fides Irish company to use for a money making scam on the sales website. Just since yesterday, the business owner has also brought to our attention a fake LinkedIn account made by the fraudsters using a fake name, claiming to be the company's sales manager. So this is all completely new to the business owner and he is indeed engaging with the Gardaí who are investigating the case. It was just reported to Gardaí on Tuesday and they don't have any further updates, but the owner has said that this is something that could indeed be happening to other companies, so the people should be aware of that. And Louise, is there any advice out there for farmers to protect themselves from potential scams like this? Yeah, Cheryl, so investigations are ongoing. The danger in the meantime is that some farmers may actually get caught out by this and see a deal on a particular part of machinery online that they've been looking out for. So the Irish Farmers Association Farm Business Chair Bill O'Keefe has advised farmers that if a deal seems too good to be true, then it probably is. O'Keefe said that this business is just one example and it could be happening anywhere across the country. He said the farmers should always go to the yard, check out the machine and make sure they physically meet someone before making a deal. And they should also receive physical paperwork as well. While such fraud has unfortunately always been around, O'Keefe said that it may be that bit more difficult to distinguish now. And Garda advice is that if somebody believes they've been a victim of fraud, they should always err on the side of caution and report the matter to a local Garda without delay. Thanks, Louise. And finally this week, a very good news story. And that is that €18,000 has been raised by the Agri Ultra Cyclists for two very good causes. Ashling, great work by these lads, but I don't exactly envy what they did this week. No, uh, 500 kilometres of cycling and 75 kilometres of hiking. Would you be up for it, Charles? Uh, I think my bike is a puncture and I can't find my runners. (laughs) So, you know, that's my excuse. I don't know what yours is. (laughs) But yeah, in fairness to them, they did absolutely mighty work. So uh, this is basically the Nine Peaks Challenge and it was completed to raise money for Mindspace Mayo and Mocker's mental health initiative, Make the Move. Now, Make the Move uh, was launched uh, back in 2018 by North Tipperary Mocker to help combat and raise awareness of suicide in the farming community. And they offer support and counselling services with dedicated counsellors. And Mindspace Mayo is aimed directly at helping young people through tough times with staff there to listen without making judgments and to provide supportive guidance as well. So all three days of this challenge were completed by agribusiness owner Alan Heaney, alongside farmer Pat Murphy from Ardrahan in County Galway and Brendan Barrett, who's originally from Bell Mullet in County Mayo. Now they were joined by other cyclists along the way. They weren't alone um, and there was actually a turnout of over 50 participants on the second day of the challenge because it was opened up to what was known as the Industry Day. So uh, other agricultural companies could uh, I suppose maybe sacrifice a staff member to go on this massively long cycle which was combined with hikes as well. So basically they hiked three different peaks in three different provinces over three days. So it was really, really intense. And every night the cyclist stayed in a camper van, which was driven by volunteers to and from different locations throughout the country. And a good night's sleep, though, might not have been on the cards because they were up at 6 a.m. and they didn't get back to base until 11 p.m. every night uh, in order to cover this marathon distance. Now, uh, we heard from Alan Heaney. There's a video on the Agriland website and app and you can have a look at um, some amazing drone footage of the cyclists and uh, the the beautiful parts of the country that they made their way through. But uh, he said to us that this cycle was all about promoting self-care, physical fitness and mental well-being alongside raising a lot of money, as you said, for these two very worthwhile causes as well. But here is Alan to give us a flavour of what they experienced out on the road. Brings its own risks. I suppose we probably underestimated uh, the mountains. Um, what happens when you get up high, um, weather changes, gets cold, misty, cloudy, and you can lose a lot of visibility. And it probably does get a little bit dangerous as well. 
we got a nice little spin on the bike, on the bike today, coming back from the ray, we got a good westerly wind, blew us the whole way over to Newport. It was nice, we got up to 40 kilometers an hour. Going up Crop Hartwick was nice. I was a bit worried about Mulray. It's, it's a dangerous mountain. The clouds are always down, it's always misty. It's visible, there's no track, so and no path, so visibility would be tough. But today was nice and clear for most of it, so you know that, that was good. And look, leading the lads around and others joining in, a bit of networking, a bit of bonding, conversation. So there you have it, Charles Allen Heaney there, who said that he slept a total of 10 hours uh, over the three days of the event and on the day prior. So about four days and 10 hours sleep. And on top of that, he had to cycle about 500 kilometres and hike 75 uh, K as well. So uh, an absolute marathon feat from um, the three lads there and fair play to them and everybody who took part in that challenge as well. And uh, we're hearing as well that uh, they're gluttons for punishment. Alan Heaney, he's actually going off uh, to a marathon in the desert next year. He's going to be doing a challenge, six marathons in five days in the Sahara next year. And uh, there are plans as well for the ultra cycle challenge as well. And uh, preliminary plans are to cycle to and hike Ireland's four highest peaks in two days. So they're they're not happy with what they've completed. So uh, fair play to them again. And uh, I would imagine many tired bodies, but very satisfied at what they had achieved. And it looked like it was a, a great way to, to catch up with people and have a chat as well. And I think that was all part of the, this initiative uh, too. So well done to them and to, to everybody who took part. And of course, everybody who contributed as well to the cause. Absolutely, Ashling. Huge congratulations to all involved. That's almost all we have time for. Just before we go, we just want to acknowledge Make-A-Wish Ireland and Gardaí in Abbey Leaks, County Leash, who were involved in the gifting of a ride-along tractor to seven-year-old Fionn, who, from the time he could walk and talk, has been fascinated with being able to drive tractors. And while in his particular circumstances he may be hindered from being able to do that, he now has his very own ride-along John Deere tractor, so he's motoring away in that as we speak. You can read more about this lovely story on the Agriland website and app. And that's where we'll leave it for today. Please don't forget to rate, review and follow The Farming Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love if you could spare some time to give us five stars and share The Farming Week with anyone you think might be interested. From Ashling, Cullum, Louise, Breffney and myself, all the best.